Would you turn, please, to Ephesians chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 3 and read through verse 7. So beginning in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now listen to me carefully. Until you and I understand the message of the cross, we will never understand who God is and what he's like. Because so much of what God revealed about himself, he revealed about himself, of course, through Jesus Christ, and so much of what he revealed of himself through Christ becomes evident and manifest to us when we see what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. If you read the other parts of the Gospels, and you do not understand what happened those last few days of Christ's life, and especially on the cross, then you're going to miss the real nature of God because so many of his attributes and so many of his qualities are exemplified at the cross. Here we see, here we see justice and love seemingly in conflict. But at the cross, God Almighty is able to make justice and love become one he still remains God and at the same time is able to redeem, to forgive, to justify, to reconcile sinners unto himself. And to miss the message of the cross is to miss ultimately to understand the nature of who God is and what he's like. Now all through the Old Testament there are many, many references to Jesus Christ as Redeemer, to Lord as Redeemer. Uh, to God as Redeemer, for example, in the 103rd Psalm, one of the most familiar ones, we begin by saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. And he says in uh, verse 3, Who forgives all thine iniquities, who heals all thy diseases, who redeems thy life from destruction. In the 63rd chapter of Isaiah and the uh, 60, uh, 16th verse, he says, Speaking of the Lord, he says, O Lord, our Father, thou art our Father, our Redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. Now, if you study the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus and the book of Isaiah are the ones who most mention our Lord as being a Redeemer. And when you think about what the Bible says and the whole message of the Bible, think about this. The Bible, in essence, is the story of God's redeeming love of mankind. And let me show you how that's true all the way through the Bible. If you can just uh, jot down these scriptures, and maybe you'll want to remember this, but beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, there is redemption planned. Beginning in chapter 3 of Genesis and going through 11, the fall, the flood, and so forth, is redemption required. Beginning in the 11th chapter of Genesis and going through the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, is redemption prepared for. He chooses Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, his 12 sons. Judah is the primary one through whom the Messiah comes. The whole genealogical line of the Messiah comes through the tribe of Judah. Then when you come to the Gospels, you have redemption effected. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he paid the price. In the book of Acts, you have the redemption shared as the New Testament church develops and the gospel is being spread. In the epistles, you have redemption explained as Paul and James and Peter began to explain the life of Jesus Christ and show us how to apply it. In the book of the Revelation, you and I have redemption consummated when Almighty God brings this whole thing to a conclusion. So the whole Bible really is the story of God's redeeming love. Or if you want to look at it this way, the Old Testament anticipates God's redemption. Uh, the Gospels 
uh, give us a, a, the effectiveness of it in the life of Christ, the life of those of us who uh, have been saved. The uh, epistles here are an application uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the whole redemptive plan. And then the book of the Revelation, of course, is God's redemption as it is achieved ultimately when the whole world bows before Jesus Christ and recognizes him as Lord. You can take the Bible and turn anywhere you want to, and any page you turn to, you're going to find God's redemption being effected in some way. So when we talk about redemption, we need to understand what we mean by that word. There are two Greek words primarily in the scriptures, uh, about a hundred and some times in the Old Testament, uh, there is a word referring to redemption, but in the New Testament, where I want us to primarily look at for today, there are two words. One of those words, lutron, is the word we come uh, to in Matthew chapter 20 when the Bible says that Jesus Christ gave himself, his life, a ransom, a lutron for many. The other word is a word that means to buy out of the market. And it is the word uh, from which we get agriculture uh, originally, and the word which meant the marketplace, and it is a word which means to buy out of the marketplace. So that redemption in the mind of those who were reading these epistles, they understood what Paul meant when he talked about Jesus Christ being a redeemer, because this is the way they would operate in those days in the slave markets. They would bring a slave to the market and stand him up on the block, and they would bid for the price of that slave. And so they bid for the slave, it may be a hundred dollars or a thousand in our terms, or maybe ten thousand or whatever it might be. And then when the buyer purchased the slave for so much money, uh, he gave the money and it was called redeeming the slave. That is, buying that slave for himself. And therefore the slave was no longer a, a slave to the other master, but now becomes a slave to a new master. Likewise, oftentimes, someone who maybe greatly admired a slave, maybe it was a woman or a man, they would redeem that slave that has paid the purchase price and then say to the slave, you're free. I don't want you to serve me. I redeemed you out of the slave market in order to free you that you may live your life as a normal human being. And so when Paul talked about redeeming, he talked about releasing from bondage. That is, buying out of the slave market a person whose life had been one of slavery and, judge and drudgery with no future and no hope. Their only real hope of release was dying. So in using the term redeem, they understood exactly what he meant. Now, so many of us have sung that song, redeemed how I love to proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And yet we've not quite understood exactly what we meant by that. So I want you to see today that one of the encouraging messages of the cross is that you and I are, present tense, now redeemed. That is, Almighty God, by an act within himself, has determined to pay the purchase price, the ransom, for you and for me, thereby releasing us from our old life of bondage and enslavement to sin and freeing us to become the person he desires that we be. And he paid a ransom in order to free us. So when we talk about redemption, when we talk about the fact that we have been redeemed, we're simply saying that somebody paid the price to free us from the slave market and now we are free to become and to be and to do as God would have us to do. So I want us to look at that whole process because, listen, the more you and I understand what God has done for us, several things are going to happen. The more we're going to understand who he is and what he's like, the more love and devotion and service we are going to want to give to him, not motivated out of of someone compelling us to do it or putting a guilt trip upon us, but motivated out of the fact that we are his redeemed sons and daughters. When you and I are able to perceive the real meaning of the fact that we have been redeemed by God unto himself. Look, if you will, in Revelation for just a moment. And um, I believe it's chapter uh, 5. 
Uh, look, if you will, in verse 9, in uh, the Revelation, he says in verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, speaking to Christ, and to open the seals thereof, for thou was slain, and hast past tense redeemed us unto God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And, you've made unto, and you have made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So that in the uh, future times when the whole angelic host is singing and all the saints of God, we're going to be praising Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, who by his own blood purchased us from the slave markets of sin and freed us unto Almighty God. But there's some facets of this that I want us to see because you and I need to see it for ourselves. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, what you're going to discover today is this. There is absolutely no possible way for you to be made acceptable in the eyes of God unless, first of all, you have been redeemed by him. So I want you to see that redemption is absolutely essential to salvation. And when you and I understand what he's done for us, we're going to be wanting, desiring, intensely desiring to serve the Lord and to obey him. And we'll be more apt to be able to share with someone else more accurately what our Lord has done. So the first thing I want us to see here is this, and that is man's need of redemption. Because he says he has loosed us from something, freed us from something, bought us out of something unto himself. Now, why does man need to be redeemed? If you'll turn to Romans chapter 6 for just a moment, and while you're turning there, let me remind you that in the Garden of Eden, God had created a perfect environment for two perfect people, and then he allowed them to be tested, and they yielded and rebelled against God by simply saying, we want to know more than we ought to know. We want to do what we ought not to do. They sinned against God and the very spring, the fountainhead of the whole human race is poison. So the Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none good, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. So all of us are deliberately, willfully sinners against God. Now, with that being true, what we forget is this. Somebody says, oh, yes, everybody sins. Now, watch this. People joke about sin. They joke about preachers preaching about sin. They joke about being sinners. They joke about sinning. But let me show you how Satan has used their joking attitude and their ignorance to enslave them. The very nature of sin is that sin enslaves the one who partakes of it. It isn't a matter of me doing something wrong, transgressing a law over here, or violating a principle over here. When we sin against God, the Bible says that you and I become slaves to sin. And so you see, oftentimes the person who is a slave says, man, I don't want any of that religion bit. I want to be able to do just like I please. I want to do, go where I want to go, do what I want to do anytime I please. And I don't want to have to bow down to anybody. And what that person does not realize is he's simply spouting Satan's lie because the man who's doing the talking is a slave to his own sensual drives. Now listen, Romans chapter 6, look at these verses, beginning in verse 16. Let's go back to 14. Here's the hint. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. That is, once you've been saved, which the implication is, before you came under grace, you came under the dominion of sin and its power. Look in verse 16 now. Know you not, that is, don't you know, that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servant... You are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto what? Death, or of obedience unto righteousness. So what he's saying is, we can only serve one of two. Either sin, which has its ultimate consequence in eternal death, or righteousness, or Jesus Christ, which has its ultimate consequence in eternal life. All of us are either serving the Lord Jesus Christ, or we are serving a sin, or those human and sensual drives, legitimate drives, but perverted and distorted drives of the flesh, we become servants of sin. I've never met a lost man yet who was willing to admit upon first confronting him with the fact that he's a slave 
that he's a slave to anything. We like to explain it away, rationalize it away, think that we can do just like we please. The Bible says a man is either a servant of righteousness, right doing, or he is a servant of and to sin with the ultimate consequence of eternal death. That means that every single one of us seated here and all of you who are watching and listening, every single one of us is a servant to someone. All right, look if you will in uh, verse um, 18. Being then made free from sin, that is, its enslaving power since we've been saved, you have become the servants of righteousness. So there again we see the contrast. And then if you look on down in verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members... Servants to righteousness unto holiness. And then if you will in verse 22. But now being made free from sin's enslaving power and it becomes servants to God. You have your fruit now unto God or unto holiness and the end is everlasting life. So when a man sins against God what he must realize is this. He's not simply just committing some isolated act. He is becoming enslaved by his drives, enslaved by her habits, enslaved because the nature of sin is to bind us up and to make us unfit, useless, miserable, wretched, failures, and ultimately suffering eternal consequences of death. Now what he's saying here when he describes Jesus Christ is the, as the Redeemer is this, that God Almighty looking upon mankind seeing man enslaved in sin, knew because of his justice, now watch this, because of his justice and his righteousness and his holiness, God had to do something in order to save man and at the same time still remain holy. Remember the law we mentioned a couple of Sundays ago that God being holy, righteous, and just could not say to a condemned, guilty, unrighteous, vile sinner, I'm just going to forget the whole thing. He can't do that and still remain holy because he sent out a decree, the soul that sinneth it shall die. So God faced the consequence of what is he going to do about saving mankind if he's made the law that every man who sins is going to suffer eternal punishment. How is God going to save man when every man is a sinner by nature, every man is a sinner by action? What can God do to redeem and that is to buy out, to release and liberate from this encroachment, from this bondage and imprisonment, those whom he loves and bring them back to himself and free them unto himself? Well, the second thing I want you to notice here is God's provision for our redemption. And I want you to follow closely and look at several verses here with me, if you will. Turn, if you will, to, Gal to Genesis chapter 3. And I want to show you something very interesting. In the Garden of Eden, you'll recall that um, Adam and Eve having sinned, the scripture says that God made them coats of skins to cover their shame. Now to have a coat of skin, you've got to have an animal. To have to have an animal skin, you must have killed that animal, shed its blood. Well, it's interesting when you begin to look, first of all, uh, at his provision. When you begin to look at the prophecy that God gave of his redemption of mankind, who heard the first prophetic word about Jesus Christ coming as our Redeemer? It is interesting and probably surprising when you and I begin to see that. If you'll notice in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 3, the Lord is talking to the devil. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Satan, because you've done this, that is you have, you have intervened and caused rebellion among Adam and Eve, because you've done this thing, you are cursed above all the cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now listen, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now listen, a woman doesn't have seed, which is a little prophetic bird's eye view of what about Jesus Christ? That he is virgin born. He had to be virgin born in order to be man's redeemer. Now watch this. He says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman's seed, which is speaking of Christ. It, that is, he, 
shall bruise thy head, Satan, and ultimately destroy you. But you're going to bruise his heel. You're going to injure him. So the first prophetic word of a coming redeemer was not given to Adam and Eve, but it was given to Satan himself. God said to Satan, the one who is to come is going to bruise your head. That means you're going to get wiped out. You're going to bruise his heel. He's going to be injured. God prophesied to Satan, and of course later to Adam and Eve, in the very beginning, at the very beginning of the fall, that God would execute some point in history and time that which was necessary in order to bring man back to himself having rebelled against God. Then one of the most beautiful verses in the scripture, uh, almost overlooked in Galatians chapter 4, if you'll turn there for a moment. Galatians chapter 4, one of the most significant verses in the Bible when it comes to seeing God as the sovereign over the whole universe. One of these verses in Galatians chapter 4, when you read this and you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, and then you begin to look at history. You look at the Egyptian civilization, the Babylonian civilization, the Assyrian civilization. When you look at the Greeks and the Romans, the whole Western world and all that we have today, when this verse of Scripture states what it states, there is a whole world of history and literature and politics and geography and linguistics. The whole world is wrapped up and centered around verse 4 of Galatians 4. Look to see what he says. He says, but when the fullness of time was come, that is, in God's timetable, when the fullness of time was completed, God did something. He sent his son, made of a woman, that is, from a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, or that is, become the children of God. Now, let me explain what that means. That simply means that in God's timetable, at a given time designated by him and prepared by him, when the world was right, and if you'll think about how the uh, systems of the world had changed from the time of Adam and Eve all the way up to the time of Rome, when in the Roman days in which Jesus Christ was born, there was the Pax Romanus, the peace of Rome. Rome dominated the world. You could go most any place safely. You could speak one language and be heard and understood by most people in the world. A man was free to preach the gospel under Roman rule. When you look to see that, that the history says all roads led to Rome, the whole world politically, linguistically, and socially, and uh, theologically, the gods of their days had proven to be failures. The philosophers of Rome as the philosophers of, Greeks, of the Greeks had given up their gods for the most part and saying, you know, somehow it's not all working. In the fullness of time, that is in the very split second of history, when those men from the east saw the star, maybe weeks and months ahead of time, and came to the place of Bethlehem where Jesus Christ was born. I'm going to tell you, my friend, that was prepared from the beginning of time, before the foundation of the world, from the Garden of Eden, when he said to Adam, when he said to Satan, Satan, one is coming who will bruise your head. You will injure his heel, but he'll bruise your head. God set in motion the stars in the universe, the earth and all of its orbit, every single thing God set in motion to bring about one thing. And that is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he says, to redeem those of us who were under the curse of the law. Now, what does he mean by living under the curse of the law? If you recall before uh, Moses came along, there was no Ten Commandments. There was a law in the heart of man. God gave to mankind the Ten Commandments, not to save man by, but to show mankind the standard of God, the righteousness and the holiness of God. But he gave to mankind a law that did not bring about salvation, but showed man his inadequacy to live up to the law. Who among us has, can, will, ever will be able to live up to the Ten Commandments? The Bible says that if you've broken one, you've violated all of them, and so all of us are guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. Those commandments were given to us to show us our inadequacy to live up to God's righteous and holy standards. So all of us have been born under the law. That is, understanding that we cannot match up to God's requirements. So the law was not given to save man, but to show him that he needs more than his own self-effort. 
So from the very beginning back there, they were to cut the throat of the sheep, offer them as a sacrifice, and God gave to them the law, that when a man comes confessing his sin, bringing an untarnished, unblemished sheep, gives it to the priest, the sins are confessed, and the sins are repented of, then God would forgive that man of his sin on the basis, listen, on the basis that he obeyed God by providing the sheep, shedding the blood, and trusting in what God said. When the blood is shed and sins are confessed, sins will be, then be forgiven. This is the end of side one. Please turn your cassette over now for the continuation of Dr. Stanley's message. The book of Hebrews says that all of the shedding of all of that blood, the sheep, the goat, the bulls, and all of that, was a foreshadowing of that which was to come. All of that was a symbol. All of that was a type. All of that was a prophecy of that which was to come. And you recall when Jesus Christ showed up at the uh, Jordan River one day in the first chapter of John. Look at that, if you will. Verse 36. The Bible says that Jesus showed up upon the scene and John the Baptist, who had been preaching and baptizing, said when he saw him in verse 36, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, look, he said, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin, the sins of the world. Jesus Christ came into this world, he said, to give his life a what? A ransom, a price, a purchase price for many, that is for all of us. So that all down through history, God has been preparing in prophetical images and types, as well as in the word, that there would come a time when the Redeemer would come that could redeem man of his sins. You recall, <clears throat> for example, the temple when Jesus Christ was crucified. You recall the Bible says there was a veil that separated man from the Holy of Holies. Up until this time, the high priest once a year could go into the Holy of Holies and atone for the sin of all of the nation of Israel by sprinkling blood upon the mercy seat, the horns of the altar. When Jesus Christ was crucified, the Bible says that veil was rent not from bottom to top. Men could have done that, but it was rent from top to bottom. God rent the veil, which means that he opened the way for men to be saved, no longer by the shedding of blood, but that God was now releasing mankind from the enslavement of sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, whose life blood atoned and was adequate payment to redeem every man everywhere from the slave markets of sin. So let's go through some scriptures here, beginning in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and let me show you how he says exactly in scripture what I'm referring to here. In the 11th verse of Hebrews chapter 9, he says, But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come. He's a type of the high priest. He says, Good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Listen, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once under the holy place, having obtained what? Eternal redemption for us. That is, no longer did the priest have to go in and offer the blood of a sheep, a lamb, or a goat, but now, here's what he's saying. Now watch this. He says that when Jesus Christ was crucified, here's what happened. He, the Lamb of God, the consummation, the fulfillment, the end of all the shedding of the blood of sheep and goat and bull and lambs and uh, doves. He says the Lamb of God, not the Lamb in the sheepfold, the Lamb of God nailed to the tree, his blood was shed. In the shedding of that blood, he did what? The Bible says he died upon the cross and he was placed in the tomb. Jesus Christ went into the presence of God. That's what he's referring to here. Into the presence of God, the Father, carrying not the blood of a sheep, but his own blood. And the Father seeing his own blood and accepting his blood atoned for the sin of all mankind, which means on the cross, Jesus Christ, as a result, listen, now watch this, as a result of God the Father sending him. God the Father sending Jesus Christ to lay down his life and to shed his own blood as payment for man's sin. Now watch this. 
Somebody says, well, now wait a minute. Do you mean that God, desiring to save sinful man, looking to see that man is helpless to save himself, that God paid the devil off by sending his son and giving the devil Jesus Christ? And the answer is absolutely not. Now let me show you something here because you'll hear sermons once in a while and somebody will tell you that Jesus Christ came as a payment, bought us out of the slave market of sin, and Satan had a heyday. Satan did not have a heyday. Listen, why did Jesus Christ come? Because we read in, in Galatians chapter 4 that in the fullness of time, God sending his own son in human flesh, born of a woman, in order to redeem us from the curse of the law. No way in the world for us to be saved except by faith in him. It is God who sent the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says he atoned for our sin. He paid the price. The blood of Jesus Christ was the ransom. That was the money. All of us, so to speak, were standing on the slave block of sin. And God the Father came upon the scene, gave his son Jesus Christ to take your place and my place. And that's why the word substitute is absolutely essential to understanding the atonement. God the Father gives his son Jesus Christ, puts him on the block. He is payment, and that means that all the rest of us go free. So when we say that Jesus Christ is our Redeemer, that means, that, watch this, God, by an act of his own will, own grace, and own love, sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die the death of a lamb, plastered him upon the cross, crucified him, nailed him there. He suffered and died. The shedding of his blood was the redemption, the ransom for your salvation and mine. Now, he didn't turn him over to Satan. Though Jesus Christ did suffer separation from his father, which was hell to him. Now, what is it that God was doing? Who was it that he was satisfying? Who was it that he was paying off when he sent his only begotten son? Let's go back because I don't mind repeating this. This is absolutely essential to understanding the whole purpose and theme and the whole theological realm of atonement. It was God who was righteous, not the devil. It is God who is holy. It is God who is just. God made a decree. His decree was the soul that sent it that shall die. It is God who had to come up with a way of redeeming you and me from sin. That meant that God had to initiate, God had to create, God had to come up with some kind of an idea whereby he could still remain just, righteous, and holy, condemning sin, sending its punishment where it belongs. How could he do that when you and I are sinners Having violated every principle of God, how could God still accept us, save us? How could we be accepted in the beloved and him still be, remain just and holy? Then Almighty God sent his only begotten Son. Now watch this. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, God the Father who decreed the law of the penalty of sin is death is the same God who gave his only begotten Son who provided the ransom so that the death of Jesus Christ satisfied the demands of God his Father in the fact that when Jesus died, he satisfied God's requirement for the penalty of sin, which is death and the shedding of blood. So that Jesus Christ is the Father's, rede is the Father's redemption, whereby it is possible for us to be saved and accepted in the beloved and the price for our sins have been paid for in the person of Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you what that ought to do to you. The next time you sin against God, my friend, remember, it cost Almighty God the best, the only, the only son he had, it cost him in order to free you, liberate you, redeem you, capture you and bring you back from the law of sin and death. And you see, we oftentimes think one little sin is isolated here and one little sin is isolated there and we don't seem to think much about the effect. But remember this, had you been, and you've heard people say this, and you've said, oh, ho, 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 yeah, that really makes me feel important. But I want to tell you a theological fact. If you had been the only person whom God created on the face of this earth. You're the only one. None other but you. 
and you sinned against God, God would have to have sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, just for you. Because you see, there is no way for man to save himself. And you think about this, in the mind of God, he sent him for you anyway. You and I can think of the billions of people in the world, but you know how God sees them? While he sees the billions, he sees that his only begotten son was sent personally, specifically, particularly for you and you and you and you and you and you. God loves you enough to have sent his only begotten son just for you. He substituted him for you. And the only reason you and I are not going to split hell wide open one of these days is certainly not because we don't deserve it. It is because somebody else split it wide open before us. And that is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He not only suffered hell and death for us, but because he was the Lord God Almighty, God Almighty resurrected him to show mankind that when he came before the Father with his own blood to say, Father, here is my blood, the ultimate sacrifice for the sin of mankind, proof that Almighty God accepted Jesus Christ. Atoning death is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Were there no resurrection, you and I would not have known whether it worked or not. But the fact that he was crucified, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again says that he seated at the Father's right hand is God's declaration to the world. The redemption has been accepted, the ransom has been paid, and mankind is free forever. And that's what we mean by redemption. That Almighty God, listen, he purposed to buy you, my friend. He sent his only begotten son who got on the block and freed you to become the person you ought to be simply because he loves you. And there was not one single thing in any one of us that could merit any of that from Almighty God. Let me ask you a question. How many of you fathers? How many of you moms would go to a slave market and find a wretched, half-naked, Bony, weak, helpless, near-to-death slave and say, in order to free you, I want my son to take your place. My son's going to become the slave. You're going to be free. Let's face it. I doubt if there's a one of us in here who would do it. But I want to tell you something, my friend. We have a distorted view of sin. We cover it up. We rationalize it. We do everything imaginable. But God saw you and me sinfully as we are. Everything stripped off. He said it's vile. It's wicked. It's rebellious. It's, it, it's iniquitous. And he said, son, for that motley, despicable, unrighteous, ungodly, transgressing crowd, I'm sending you, and I'm going to free them. That's how you and I got saved. That Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, became the ransom for you and for me. Now listen to me carefully. You're gonna, if you don't hear me carefully this time, you're going to misquote me and it's going to be bad news. Now listen. When Jesus Christ went to the cross and died, for whose sin did he die? How many people? He says, it's not my will that any man should perish. If it's not his will that any man should perish, then Almighty God, knowing sin as it, he knows it, knows that he's the only one who can keep anybody from perishing. So God sent his only begotten son and he said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will do what? I will draw what? All men unto me. So that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he died for whom? All men. That means, listen now, watch this carefully. That means the sin of all mankind has been what? It's been paid for. That listen, now watch this, that means that everybody 
that all men have been redeemed. But it does not mean that all men will ever begin to experience the blessings of that redemption. And let me clarify that. And you see, I, wanna, I, I must say that because, you see, we must understand what he did at the cross. When he went to the cross, he died for mankind. Listen, let me ask you a question. A thousand years from now, if a fellow wants to get saved, how's he going to be saved? Same way you and I are saved, right? That is, he's coming through the redemption of Jesus Christ, right? Amen? All right. If that be true, we say that Jesus Christ has died for all mankind. 2,000 years ago, whom did he redeem? Every man. So that all men everywhere have had their sins atoned for. That does not mean they're saved because, listen, there's a difference in having been redeemed, having my sins paid for, having my penalty taken care of, there's a difference in that and my accepting the payment of that sin, receiving Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, and experiencing personal redemption. And until I by faith accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, repenting of my sins, God's whole redemptive plan, Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 in the fullness of time, in the Garden of Eden, all the prophecies, all the types, all the lamb, all the blood that was shed. He says all of that is null and void and absolutely useless and to no avail whatsoever to the individual who refuses to confess, repent, acknowledge Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and turn their life over to him. Because my sin has been atoned for, because I have been redeemed does not mean I'm free. I'm not free until I am willing to experience by faith Christ as my Savior, my Lord, and my Redeemer. But any man on the face of this earth can walk into the presence of Jesus Christ confessing and repenting of his sins and he will be saved instantaneously because Jesus Christ no longer has to go to the cross. All you and I have to do is to turn and look behind us and see that the cross 2,000 years ago 2,000 years ago, redemption was prepared for and provided for all mankind. And here's what I want you to see. That when a man rejects the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what he's doing? He's saying, God, nothing doing. You say that's the only way? That's not the only way because I have another way. What he's doing is he's saying, I'm going to be saved. I'm going to be made acceptable some other way. But you see, what is it that makes us acceptable? It is God's grace, His justice, His love, and His mercy providing a ransom whereby our sins are atoned for, the penalty has been paid, and we are captured and released and liberated from a life of sin. The man who's looking for another way does not understand God's whole economy of salvation, nor does he understand who God is, what He's like, nor does he understand the attributes of God. Now watch this carefully. If I say to you that everybody's been redeemed and that's all you hear, that's what the universalists believe. And they believe everybody's saved, God's accepted everybody, everybody's going to make it, everybody's going to heaven. We're just telling them where they're going, that's all. And that is totally erroneous. It is a false doctrine and can nowhere be proved in the Bible. When I say that every man has been redeemed, I mean by that, get me clearly, that all the price that can ever be paid has been paid. All the ransom that need ever be paid has been paid. All the ransom that can atone for man's sin has been atoned for. All that anybody can ever do has been done by God through his son. Nothing else to be done. And now it is man's choice to accept God's redemption in Christ Jesus. And if by repentance of his sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ... He, listen, man chooses to accept redemption, then it is his. Until he, re, until he is willing to accept it, God's redemptive plan is null and void to him. He is lost and on his way to hell, and there is no way for man to save himself. Because if there had been, God would not have done 
what he did in order to save mankind. Now I want you to think about something for a moment. If you were on the slave block, half naked, poorly fed, a slave laborer with no hope of escape, no way out, and your only hope of changing things would be death, and somebody came along. And the price was $1 million for you, and somebody said, I'll redeem him. I'll redeem her. And the man who made that decision was well-dressed. You knew he could afford the money. And so they took you off the block. When you come to the man, he takes the chains off your hands, shackles off your feet, and he says to you, you're free. You say, what do you mean I'm free? You're just free. Well, I've come to be your slave. Haven't you bought me? I bought you to free you, not to make you a slave. And the man said to you, for the rest of your life, you're free. You can now become what you were meant to become. You can now begin to be what your maker wanted you to be. You are a free human being. Let me ask you something. What would be your response? Would you not, not drop at his feet and kiss his feet in humility and thanksgiving and gratitude? Would we not be willing to say to him, Master, because you've freed me, I choose voluntarily to serve you the rest of my life. I choose voluntarily to go where you want me to go, do what you want me to do, be what you want me to be. You paid an enormous price to free me. I want you to know that I'm willingly choosing to be your servant. And he says in response, if you choose to serve me, I'll give you the best of everything. You'll have the very finest and the very best, but I want you to know you're not compelled to serve me. But you say, Master, I choose to serve you because I love you. And my friend, let me ask you a question. Isn't that what God has already done for you and me? We were hell bound. Satan had our name on his books in hell. And God gave his only begotten son, far more valuable than a million dollars, to redeem you and me. And let me ask you one simple question. Since the day you, by faith, experienced redemption, have you been loving him, serving him, giving to him, following him, obeying him, motivated by the simple understanding that God did something for you nobody on the face of this earth could do? Or have you been one of those persons who's held on till you tithe and he paid a million for you? Not too sure you want to get too involved in church, don't want to do too much because after all, you don't want to get too involved. And he paid a million for you. Let me tell you something. When you and I examine our lives, how little we give, how little we do, in the light of what he did, freeing us to become all that we could possibly be, Every single one of us, every saint of God ought to bow on their knees, their face before God every day. Thanksgiving and praise and adoration, worship and devotion. Never questioning giving. Never questioning service. Never questioning obeying. Never questioning our devotion to him. If you'd been a slave, you'd treat a human master the next thing to God. And what he's saying to you and to me. I freed you, and if you choose to serve me, you'll have life's best here 
and hereafter. And when I look at the cross, I know he deserves all of me. Amen.